those. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are very happy to have both of you here, and if I might, um, just a, beginning with a, a word of congratulations, because within the past few days, uh, first of all, um, I should mention that the New York Film Critics Circle Award voted Best Actor of the Year to Daniel Day-Lewis in There Will Be Blood. <laughs> And <laughs> not to be outdone on the West Coast, the LA Film Critics voted at least three awards, uh, Best Actor to Daniel Day-Lewis, Best Director to Paul Thomas Anderson, and Best Film to There Will Be Blood. <laughs> so, congratulations to you both. Um, I'm gonna start with a couple of questions before we open it up to the audience. Um, while watching this film, especially the second time, I felt that it was less about um, a, a, a traditional hero than a really enigmatic character about whom I ultimately don't learn that much from the film, at least on a psychological level. Um, and I was wondering whether at any point either of you felt the need to create some sort of backstory. For example, did you ever talk about whether Daniel Plainview had particular relationships with women or parents or anything like that, or would that all have been extraneous to what, it, what you were doing with the film? Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> certainly, no, not extraneous, no. Uh, we talked about it uh, to some extent, and um, I dare say Paul uh, would have uh, would have uh, imagine that, that that's the work that I do regardless of any <laughs> um, encouragement from him. Um, yes, uh, there's no choice really but to do that work and not because, not only because you need to do it, um, because I suppose finally the only way that I have any hope of convincing anybody else uh, uh, that I've um, uh, found my way into, in, 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 into another life is, is first, firstly to convince myself and there's no possibility of doing that unless, unless I understand as much as I possibly can. You can never understand everything but um, at some level to understand um, what has led that man to the place at which you discover him. Um, that's, but that sounds like a job and that's misleading because it's, it's not that. It's really, you know, it's for the pure pleasure of that discovery that, that uh, that's where the work gets done and the pleasure, mm -hmm. yeah. And for you, I mean, did you have an idea of what had happened to Daniel Plainview before we met him that informed some of your decisions? A little bit, but not, not, but not too much. I mean, um, it was enough for me to, to, to discover him with a pickaxe in, in the middle of a mining shaft, you know, hacking away, trying to get whatever he needed to get. Um, at least to get started, to get on the road to, to writing it, and um, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't feel the need to do that kind of stuff, and to, or, or if I did, um, I don't remember it now. Sure. It's such a blur. Yeah, that's all right. Well, because already a few critics have compared this film to Citizen Kane, and that is, you know, uh, I can understand the comparison partly because you have a character at the center um, that isn't necessarily likable as he keeps acquiring and seems to have a kind of ambition and greed. But at the end of Citizen Kane, one can surmise that what he really wanted, Charles Foster Kane, was love. You know, he went to extreme lengths to get it, never really had it. I was curious whether for either of you, there was a sense of what does Daniel want ultimately? Because you know, it, it's, it's very, for me, fascinating that at the end, I don't really know what was driving him apart from the sheer physical challenge that is presented so magnificently. But was there anything like that, any idea that, that you had in mind? <laughs> well, 
Well, I think um, in, in, in a way it's, it's at the very center of that experience somehow, the fact that no matter what those men went in pursuit of, and many of them left behind um, a decent way of life, a family, um, in the hope of achieving this unimaginable wealth, um, found themselves then living like savages in holes in the ground, um, many of them utterly broken in, in, in pursuit of it. Um, but, but I think no matter what, what led them to that place, that the work somehow becomes an end in itself, and I think that's certainly at the center of Plainview's life, mm. is that um, you, know, you discover him at the, you know, the end of the, our story in the Plainview mansion, which I kind of see almost as a, like a pyramid that the pharaohs built for themselves, which in essence was a coffin. Um, having separated himself piece by piece from, from mankind and um, uh, but the center of his life still remains that experience that's the lack that's the lack that he feels maybe at the end and we even we didn't have time we filmed in the Doheny mansion in in Los Angeles. I don't know if any of you have ever been to that place. It's a museum. It was Doheny's house. And, and uh, when Upton Sinclair wrote the book Oil, he, he very loosely based the character on Edward Doheny's life. Um, and we, we shot there for <laughs> those last couple of scenes. Um, but and apparently we, there was really a private bowling alley in that mansion. Yeah. Because yeah, it struck so me as one of the most magnificent cinematic oh. devices, and I wanted to ascribe it to you, but I guess the mansion had it. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was really there. <laughs> um, but it was the way it was used. <laughs> and we'd imagined that maybe we could shoot some scenes where we'd see Plainview camping in his own house. Um, because that's where he still is. He's still out there in the fields, even having put on a jacket and hat, you know, in the, you know, in the middle of his life, as he's, you know, he's found what he's looking for. He's got it. It's there. He doesn't really need to do it, but he's doing it anyway. The fever is an end in itself, and and you know, the guys that are doing the work. Uh, he could just as easily do that work himself, probably, you know, maybe even do it better than they're doing it. And, and he's, he's removed already from the very center uh, of his own experience. Yeah. Do you want to add anything to that? No. I would just want to say that Doheny built the bowling alley in that mansion. And I only knew about it because when he got in trouble, and with the Teapot Dome sc scandal in the 20s, he set up his team of lawyers in the bowling alley, and I saw a great photograph of all these lawyers and desks down in this bowling alley. So I knew it existed, and I thought, that's pretty good. Yeah. But actually, the notion of using the bowling ball and then the pin as weapons, um, I mean, it, it was one of the many fight scenes in the film that I found quite remarkable. And, and I did want to ask ab about that. I mean, the way that the fight scenes between you and, and Paul Dano were staged, they, they seemed terribly, quote, real, unquote. In other words, it, it not so much choreographed or storyboarded as just rough and tumble. Could you talk a little about how that worked? Well, Paul Dano's got the bruises to prove it, you know, <laughs> that, that they were real, at least initially to a certain extent. And um, I think for all of us, to, to you know when you know you're gonna when you know you're gonna kind of get a situation where you're gonna smack each other around everybody um, starts really paying attention in a great way I mean you, I mean it because we're generally you're move, making a film and you're and you are paying attention but you know let's let's everybody try to get this right the first time so that we don't have to hit each other more often than we have to <laughs> <laughs> and that's more or less how you approach that stuff, is try to ideally have them hit each other as, as little as possible. And um, We scheduled it very intelligently that the, 
the reservoir scene would be shot uh, on one day, and then the next day we would do the baptism scene so Paul Dano could, could get his <laughs> retribution immediately the next day. That's how you approach those scenes. Okay. <laughs> and, and for you, in, in terms of the... I mean, did you prepare with Paul Dano at all? Mm -hmm. Did you just go right into it and, and have the camera follow you, basically? Yeah, there was nothing really to do except, uh, except get on with it. Um, we had very little time there, too. I mean, the Doheny Mansion is a museum now. Um, belongs to the Doheny Trust, mm -hmm. which in turn employs a large army of, uh, of young men and women in very crisp uniforms who, who watch every single move that you make in the place. I cannot imagine what they thought we were up to in the place uh, with the screams and bellows um, coming from the, the dungeon um, we were. But, um, but nonetheless, anyhow, we, we had no time to waste, and that kind of suited us. That was true of really the whole experience, and I think it really suited us you know, for all that we, it wasn't a short period of time, the shoot, but it was a lot of story to try and tell within that time. And so on any given day, we, we had a lot of ground to cover. And the Doheny Mansion was perhaps the most intense example of that. I was thinking, you know, going back to your earlier question, Annette, I mean, it's really about uh, leisure, isn't it? It's, it we're <laughs> this is our great cur the curse of, uh, of you know, what do you do when you have time? What, what, what does a man or a woman do when, when, they, don't, when they, have to, they don't have to work anymore? And we're constantly inventing these fantastical things for ourselves um, uh, to, to, to give what we believe might be some significance uh, to our lives during that time. We, we understand it's a great privilege not having to work, and yet, somehow we're missing the point because very often it's our work, if we're lucky enough to do something that we enjoy and believe in, it's our work that sustained us more than anything else. And so the Plainview Mansion, it's a, the prototype almost of the, the age of leisure. Mm -hmm. You know, the bowling alley, I mean, now what the fuck do I do? Uh, uh, well, I'll throw balls down the lane and see if I can knock some skittles over it. It doesn't work. It, it didn't work for Plainview anyway. Yeah. Well, I think that's one of the things I find most powerful about the film, the contrast between the physical natural world in which I guess most of the first half takes place and that final sort of interior space where plain view has no meaning anymore. I mean, I know this is adapted from a novel, or at least from the first 150 pages of Upton Sinclair's uh, 1927 book, but what I take away from this film, at least what stayed in my head, is this elemental thing, I, I mentioned it before the film, the way that at the beginning, you know, you've got earth, air, with the buzzing of insects and fire and then the, the liquid of, of the black oil, and the way that later the smoke blackens the sky from the fire like the oil. It feels so physical, so visceral, and I was wondering how much of that is in the novel and how much came from literally being in the space where you shot the film. In other words, how much of the film took on its shape from the location, and I know it was Marfa, Texas, where Giant was shot as well, so could you talk a little about that? I do think it's important to say that the novel has no relevance when we're making, right. doing our story. I mean, the, for all that it might have started Paul off on his journey, and which in turn led to, to our partnership and me embarking on mine in a different way, but but necessarily we have to separate ourselves from any precedent, from any influence, from anything other than the very, very specific world that we are attempting to imagine and to populate with people that, um, that, that help, help us to tell that story. So from that point of view, um, one would, even if there had been some connection, one would resist very much this, the, the, the uh, conscious sense of that. Right. Yeah. And for you, I mean, I, I know that you're the screenwriter as well as the director. Um, at what point does Paul Thomas Anderson, the screenwriter, sort of have to yield um, a, towards the director who's got actors and physical locations? In other words, how much of the script ultimately were you faithful to? 
Well, it's all, it, ideally, in a perfect world, there's a, a, it's like a baton handoff um, that, that I can do, you know, it's, it's, it's really fun to have an ego as a writer. You know, you're alone in your room, you're making yourself laugh, you're, you're by yourself, you're doing all that, that stuff, and it's gleeful, you know, you don't want it to end, but, because you you enter into the other part that, that should be um, selfless and have to hand off to someone else, and and that's that's actually when it starts getting good. It's scary at first. It's it's a little bit terrifying. Even even as much as I would look forward to working with Daniel and would trust Daniel, you know, but that that has that becomes his now. He's got his job, and and now we're in it together. Now you have a partner in crime that it's best, that's what it is. It's really like a partner in crime who, who has, has his job to do. Um, and the writer really gets left, you know, at, at the door, which is as it should be. And every once in a while, you know, I mean, it's great to kind of call on the, the, being able to write a few scenes because Nine times out of ten, when you're having a problem with a scene, it's because of the writing. It's not really because of anything else. And so to be able to kind of clean that stuff up, it becomes helpful. But um, yeah, it's a terrifying baton handoff, but it, it's a great one when it happens. And it's particularly great when you're working, for me, when you're working with Daniel. You know? Sure. I can understand that. I mean, you're in almost every scene. and. Um, for me, there's just this, this power that you yourself embody, and it's some of your little choices, and I'm not sure how much of this was in the script or how much you improvised together. Um, I was aware the second time that you're often chewing. I mean, uh, most obviously in that final scene with, uh, uh, at the bowling alley, you know, chomping the cold steak, but, but even earlier, it's like you, you seem to exert a certain power as Daniel Plainsview, because when Eli's talking to you, whatever, you seem to always be chewing something. Um, is, is that my imagination? Uh, if that's what you saw, then, <laughs> then no, it's not. I, 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 I'd, ha I'd have to, I'd probably have to say that, that as far as I'm possibly able to do it, um, I make absolutely no, you know, the word choice to me, it seems somehow misleading in as far as even though there the are undoubtedly decisions being made, yeah. thousands every day by Paul, um, who's overseeing the whole world that he's creating, and by me in a different way, my decision-making process has to happen in such a way that I'm absolutely unaware of it. Um, Otherwise, I'm already somehow objectifying um, a situation uh, that, 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 that demands something utterly different. So, so it may well be that I'm chewing an awful lot uh, during the course of it, but I can't tell you for what reason I'm doing that. Um, okay. I, can't, I can't really account for that. Um, it's all right, you don't have to. Mm. And sometimes I read in and project way too much than I should, but um, yeah, it, it worked. It, it worked in, in a very deep way. I, I don't know, Paul? No. There's something, I mean, there is something, I'm kind of reinvent, I'm trying to look at it from a different point of view now, because I've no excuse not to look at it from the outside now. Um, really, except I don't really enjoy doing that, but, but, um, but uh, there's something about compulsive oral gratification, I think, in a human being um, uh, that maybe, uh, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an insatiable, um, there's a rapaciousness there that, um, that, uh, I don't know, I'm mm. clutching at straws. No, actually, that, that sounds quite articulate to me. <laughs> I would notice it when Daniel was, was, was chewing on something because, you know, that was my job, to be objective, actually, at that point and notice what was going on. 
Um, he does it at all the right moments, I'll tell you that. Yeah. And it's, it's almost like as if he wanted to chew up and spit out Eli. You know, there's, there's a certain control that that suggested to me. But I could be wrong. <laughs> well, yeah, but that, that certainly wasn't part of my scheme. I mean, but my, my problem was that my teeth had gone by that stage. And so you, all you can do is suck the blood out of a piece of steak and, and, <laughs> and, and spit out the gristle. I mean, that, that, that's the nearest thing to sustenance that I can ever really... Um, take in by that stage Great. in my life. <laughs> um, I did want to ask another question about um, a film that I know Paul Thomas Anderson is very close to, and that's The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, which John Huston wrote and directed back in 48. Um, you've mentioned that it's one of your favorite films and that when making this, you gave copies to the composer, Johnny Greenwood, to Daniel. And I know that the obvious thing would be that there's a shared theme, you know, of greed and what happens to men when they come under the, when they have the impact of the physical world from which they can yield their riches. But is it as much the economical storytelling of John Huston that you were drawn to? Because this is sort of different from your ensemble piece frescoes. This is a very focused motion picture here. Yeah, probably that more than anything else. Um, the economy that the store that Treasure of Sierra Madre is told with, and and that, and the idea that it, that it's that it's more or less just a play, um, but dressed up as an action film or an adventure film. But at the end of it, you're really just watching these three men go at each other, um, and one man go go slowly insane. Um, but that kind of um, vinegar in, in the storytelling, you know, and that kind of um, drive was something that was really, a, um, yeah, as an inspiration. I mean, I knew the film, I knew the film well, I knew Treasure of Sierra Madre, and I can just remember finding it like a, like a buoy, like a, like a buoy in the night, you know, just coming across it as I was starting to write the film and struggling, and trying to find a foothold and had lots of good bits and pieces, but nothing that really had a, nothing that really kind of had a cement to it and, and just, and came across it again. And it was a lifesaver. Um, yeah, I, I, Daniel's sick of hearing me talk about treasures here in Madre, sorry. but um, Well, there's yeah. just one other question about that, because the, when I first heard your voice as Daniel Plainview, Plainview and you just used the word, the word rapaciousness. I actually thought of John Huston in Chinatown. That was the voice I sort of connected to what I was hearing in There Will Be Blood. Was John Huston's voice one of the ones that you remembered, emulated? Did, did it have anything to do with the way your voice sounds in this film? Well, it may have done. I mean, I listened to a lot of recordings, none of which dated from our period, because happily for me, there aren't any that exist, so no one can say <laughs> categorically that no one spoke like that <laughs> at the time. Um, but uh, we, uh, Paul found some Dust Bowl recordings for me um, from different parts of the country, from, from the West and the Midwest, some from Fond du Lac, from Plainview's town, which were, which were absolutely um, charming and of no use whatsoever. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and uh, you know, again, Annette, I know I'm always, I see, you must feel I'm always trying to kind of dodge questions, but, no, 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 no. but um, <clears throat> the thing about the voice, which is clearly one of the deepest expressions of our very selves that, that we have, um, is that it's something that you can only approach uh, as the life reveals itself um, you're lucky that life that you're searching for begins to reveal itself in the voice. I try to hear something. I mean, hear it in my own mind. I, I, the may well, all those different influences may play some part in it, but at a given moment, I hear a sound, and then the work is trying to make that sound that I hear. And there was a moment which certainly quickened the pulse when I felt, when I felt that there was a sound that that seemed to belong to, to, to that other man. And, um, um, but uh, uh, yes, amongst others, I did, li I listened to, to, but not for, I never saw Chinatown. I, um, John Houston, I listened to some, so him talking 
in a couple of documentaries, and certainly there was something rather, there was a, an exuberance, a certain grandiose quality, a relish of the language, and, and an authority and wit that really appealed to me. Um, so uh, amongst other things, it certainly, it fed me in a certain way, yeah. I would imagine that that didn't disappoint you because John Huston is obviously one of the directors that you really admire, so that works. Um, the other night, I, I heard you say that the first sequence, which as we know, is, it's almost like a silent film. That's, that's how I felt it as you watch the physicality and all you hear is that wonderfully evocative soundtrack that Johnny Greenwood created, that the first line we actually hear is, there she is, which Daniel says when he, after the blast and he falls, he sees the silver, that that was improvised. In other words, that you just, it suddenly came out of you as opposed to something that was in the script. Correct? Yes. What I was curious about, because I heard you say it, was whether the last line, I'm finished, might have worked out that way too, because it struck me as being as much about an actor's exertion as whatever the character might be saying. So, no, that was in the script. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's the reason I made the film. <laughs> that line. <laughs> that's, that's the moment I was striving for for months, for years. No. That's, uh, when, when I read that line, I felt that, that um, I felt there was uh, the most uh, vibrant line drawn underneath uh, the whole experience that Paul had put before me when I read his script, yes. Good. <laughs> um, before we take questions from the audience, I did want to ask one other thing. Um, the sound design and the music, because I think that for many of us, um, there are moments where the tension is so heightened by the soundtrack. I mean, I, I almost felt that at moments I was watching a silent film because the dialogue wasn't the dominant part in the beginning, and at other times a very operatic film where the music almost had a transporting quality. I know it was Johnny Greenwood, and it's his first film score. Um, he's a composer in residence at the BBC and guitarist for Radiohead. Could you just talk a little bit about how that sound design evolved? Was it just something that Johnny Greenwood came up with after watching what was shot, or did he come in earlier? Did you tell him that you wanted this kind of in-between music and sound effects? Well, it's a little bit of both. There was a piece that existed in a previous form that Johnny had that he wrote, the idea behind writing the piece was um, how, to, how, to, how to write a musical piece that felt like, he was trying to write something, he always thought like, you know, how there would be a vacuum on in the other room and, you know, it turns off but you're kind of convinced that it's still running or there's a radio or a refrigerator buzzing in the next room and he just, it just never goes away. Anyway, he, in his mad, kind of way was writing a piece that was essentially trying to be a vacuum that never really went off. Mm. And, um, and so however he worked it with, with the different instrumentation and the different way that he wrote it, which is still sort of magic to me and, and a little bit of a mystery, he did it because I remember we were working so closely with this music that, he, that he'd written and we would stop and we would go to eat lunch and we were convinced that we still left the computers on, you know, that it was still playing, you know, we would just keep buzzing around in our heads, these sort of tones that he would get from all these sort of dissonant chords that would just kind of sort of collide. And so that's just him. I mean, I'm, I couldn't answer how he does it. And did you, did he come to work on the soundtrack after everything was shot or did he come in earlier and work with you while you were shooting? He came in after we shot the film a few pieces that he'd written, I'd put in his temporary score just to show him, to give him a few ideas, you know, pieces that he'd already written. And um, we started in chunks. We had, a, we had a pretty good 25 minute chunk of the film put together and I sent him that chunk. Um, and he sent me back about three minutes, you know. And then, and then we put it up against the film and it looked pretty good and we sort of kept building blocks from there, up and up and up. And then there was one defining moment after he saw the whole film he went away for about three weeks and said, okay, I'll be back. And I didn't really know what he was up to. Um, I kind of assumed that, we, you know, ideally we'd get about 45 minutes of music, maybe something like that. And he came out and he said, I, I apologize, I think I've gone overboard. And he came back with two full hours of mu <laughs> music. Um, 
some on piano, some for string quartet, and, and, and all I knew was the titles. I just saw this list of titles of things that he'd come up with, and I was just dying to get my hands on all these cues, you know? Things like Prospectors Arrive. I was like, I want to hear Prospectors Arrive. <laughs> You know, and he said there was one called Open Spaces. I said, Open, I want to hear what does Open Spaces sound like, you know? So that's more or less how it went. Good. Now, if we could raise the lights a little, um, we can take a few questions, although I know this is a, a rather late night for all of us. Gentlemen, right over there. Yes? I, if, if you have to leave, I know it's late. Just quick, quickly and quietly, those who have to go, and then we will take the questions of those who can stay. Yes? Brilliant film, brilliant screenplay. I'd like to go back to the origins of the screenplay. I was watching the film, and I was struck by the fact that there was a lot of homage Was there perhaps some homage to Kubrick's 2001 in the origins of the screenplay? Is the character Daniel is playing perhaps representing some primitive, rapacious quality of man? We also have the scene in the hole, which is like the dawn of man. Oh, and, and the scenes in the right. hole, which are reminiscent of the dawn of man right. sequence. Well, you know, I, I, I'm sur- the, clubbing the clubbing at the okay. end, yeah. Okay. The clubbing at the end does look like the monkey in 2001, and not intentionally. That's just, <laughs> Daniel was out of his mind and looked like, looked like an ape. I mean, that... It was not intentional at all. <laughs> I even thought that when he was doing it. I thought he looks, he looks like a gorilla. He looks like a monkey. It's like, um, you know, it's, it's sort of impossible to, 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 to make a film and not have it, something of 2001 in your DNA. If you love movies, whether you're intentionally trying to kind of make a, a, a kind of um, reference to it or not, which we weren't. We weren't trying to make reference to another film, but um, you know what what that is. If you love movies or you make them, is 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 probably so just in your bloodstream to begin with. Um, so it's impossible to escape. But um, I think this is a question for Daniel Day Lewis. Um. I think it's a question for me, really. <laughs> <laughs> I got uh, my shirt at uh, Agnes B. Uh, I got it a few years ago, and it's pretty terrific. Thank you. I thought maybe if, if the power of speech failed me, at least you'd have something to look at. <laughs> Does it come from Texas? I mean, were you shot or no? No, no, no. I wish I could say it did. No, no. <laughs> okay, there was a question right here. Thank you. Another incredible performance. <laughs> when you work, do you prefer a lot of takes? And if not, what if the director does? Um, I don't honestly ever remember being in that position because um, as happy as I am when something seems to occur in the way you'd wish it to uh, very quickly, I, I'm all, always happy to keep going all day. I mean, I, you know, it's, um, uh, in fact, an example of that, maybe the most obvious one I can think of is I'm finished, um, <laughs> which was something both of us had thought about and talked about a great deal before we started to shoot and then you know the moment approached and we got to it and we did it and uh, I thought this is how it is it didn't seem to occur to me there was any other possibility and we shot that for <laughs> a long time and and but it's always just I mean bearing in mind that everything is an experiment I mean the entire film is that you see is is the result of an experiment. And, and every single moment of every day for us is an experiment. And so, um, so it makes no difference, one take or 25, it makes no difference. 
difference if if your curiosity is in the right place you might as well keep just re-examining the same moment as moving on to the next one for us as it turned out we we had a great pressure of time in, in every given day we had to cover a lot of ground so so we didn't really have the luxury of doing a lot of takes for the most part and I'm happy with that too I mean for all that you'd often leaving behind you know, uh, missed opportunities, you know, they're just flying past you like the landscape flies past you in a train. Um, but nonetheless, you just have to keep moving forward and looking at what's in fr front of you, what's happening right now. So, so either way, it's, it's fine by me. And Paul is, you know, well, um, Paul is... Uh, is an ally, you know, he's not, um, he's not, uh, I never ever for one single moment felt that we were at odds in, in what we were both independently trying to achieve and what we were trying to achieve together. It always seemed to be part of the same thing. A uh, woman right here and then we'll move to this side. I wonder how it feels to depict hate and how it transforms you. And how you find yourself again. Well, I suppose it, in some respects it must be tremendously liberating. Um, uh, undoubtedly, if you get to examine hatred at that level for that period of time, there's no excuse for not being extremely nice for, for years to come <laughs> and tolerant and understanding of the people. It, it's, um, it's to be able to examine any area of human experience with impunity, bearing in mind that we all necessarily live in a state of repression so that we can coexist in society. We all experience hateful and sometimes murderous thoughts, if not every day, then maybe once a week or once a month. <laughs> and thanks be to God, we don't act upon those impulses. Um, we're socialized for the main part. But what could be more liberating and more fascinating than to discover, uh, try and explore a, a life where there is not that same kind of repression. Hmm. Yes, over here. Uh, yeah, one question for me. Uh, when you immerse yourself so completely in your roles, at what point are you able to watch yourself? Uh, not necessarily that the role you were working on, but in your earlier films, are you able to do that? You immerse yourself so fully in your roles. At what point are you able to take a step back and watch yourself, even not necessarily the film you're making, but afterwards when the role is finished? Is And for Paul, since I read that uh, it, the film was shot the, in the same place as Giant, was that film another touchstone for you? Uh, first for Daniel. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> so, uh, I'm so interested you, by Paul's question. I since you immerse my, yourself I'm, so I'm fully sorry. in any given role, yes. at what point can you okay, look that, at yourself? I'm, yes, I'm, I'm not, I hadn't forgotten the question. I was, I was in denial of the question. <laughs> I, I, um, I would really, really never feel any urge to look at work that I'd done before because I, didn't really, I don't really feel I've got anything to do with it. Um, uh, but in the case of the, as the work is continuing on 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 on, on a film, um, I mean, Paul was uh, was generous enough to allow me to to um, to, uh, to to see the film and talk to him about the film as it progressed through the editing process, and that I I I, I find very I find that a very rich. Experience. It was Stephen Frears, actually, who first opened the door of a cutting room to me, and he really did it out of exasperation more than anything else, because he couldn't understand just how naive I was. He was utterly, utterly astonished by my naivety. And uh, so he thought that maybe, but he could see I wasn't entirely stupid, so 
he, he thought that it would be interesting for me to see how a film is put together. And, and that was uh, not a destructive one, but it was a, a certain kind of a Pandora's box for me. Um, uh, and uh, if I'm able to be part, any part of that period of filmmaking, I, I, I'd, I'd love to be involved. Um, but, but no, I would have no desire to see, to see films that I'd, I'd, I'd made in the past. We're talking about Giant, which was one of my favorite films forever and ever, you know, just, um, and it was, an, it was pure coincidence that we ended up in Marfa, Texas. I, um, I didn't, I, loving Giant and knowing Giant, I didn't know that it was shot in Marfa. We were desperate to f shoot the film in California. I live in California, and it's a California story, but... I can honestly tell you, we, 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 we drove over every inch of that state looking for the right place to, to, to film, and we couldn't find what California looked like back then in California anymore. You know, there was either oil derricks or there was a Burger King sign or a freeway or it was owned, you know, the Bureau of Land Management, and that would have been impossible. So after, after searching forever, we ended up getting... Um, um, just, just opening it up to other states, New Mexico, even Nevada, Colorado, wherever it would be, Mexico, um, just to find the right thing. The right thing was what Bakersfield would have looked like before the discovery of oil. Um, and there was a certain, there was something very specific about the landscape and how it looked. So Texas was one of the states. They sent us some photographs of this ranch in Marfa, Texas, which was Perfect. It was ideal. Not only not only did it look right in terms of its of the rocks and the and the 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 the, the sand and the dust and the hills and the, and the kind of roll to the hills, but it had a private train line. So it was a miracle that we found it. And they said, "Yeah, that's where they shot Giant." And I thought, you know, oh, mm -hmm. God, there's not, you know. That. Then I thought, well, wait a minute. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. There's got to be a good energy down there, you know, and, um, and we, yeah, we <laughs> just struck, struck oil. oil. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing in Marfa, actually, there are, there are uh, it's a very, very small town, but there are um, people there that remember being extras in Giant, remember being mm. children, being extras running around, and the, some of the barbecue scenes that they have out there um, at the ranch. And, um, so it, the impression that Giant made on that town is enormous. There's a great hotel, the Paisano, and they have the Elizabeth Taylor Suite and the Rock Hudson Suite. <laughs> and uh, James Dean stayed in a house nearby. He didn't stay in the, suite, in the hotel, but so yeah. I have to t I have to tell you my Giant story because I've actually seen I've seen Giant many times more than Paul's seen it. I've actually seen it probably more times than anyone on this planet. And the reason I've seen, not that I don't love Giant, I, I love it a little bit less than I used to now, but, but the, the reason I've seen it so often is because my five-year-old son, it's his favorite film. Um, now, the reason it's his favorite film, I don't know how many of you know Giant well, but the scene in Virginia at the beginning when Rock Hudson goes to buy the horse and he comes down to breakfast the next day and he's already kind of fallen in love and there's that breakfast scene. And, and, and the breakfast scene, I don't know if you remember, but there are all these silver tureens, and one has got sausages in it, and one has got bacon, and one has got eggs, and the other has got pancakes, and God knows what else there is there. But anyhow, my five-year-old son thought that breakfast was the best breakfast he'd ever, <laughs> ever, ever seen. And so he likes to watch that film. He loses interest a little, and it's at the beginning of the film, but he loses interest a little bit after the breakfast. But, <laughs> but anyhow, so I, I love motorbike racing, and, and I try to sort of work out a scam where I can go to watch the races sometimes during the course of the year in the World Motorbike Championship. And uh, I got some tickets to go to Valencia in Spain, where, where, which is the beginning, the first and the last course of the season. And I sold the idea to the family, saying, let's go and have a holiday in Spain. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, I sort of, you know, let it be known that there was a race going on during that time, and, but we were going to have a holiday in Spain. And uh, my son said to me, will the breakfast be like in Giant? <laughs> 
And I really wanted to go to this race, so I, I said, yeah, it's going to be exactly like the Breakfast in Giant, this hotel. I, after I said, I thought, oh my God, I've just lied to my son. I, what am I going to do? I, I've, you know, I, I, I perjured myself. I, I will go to hell for this, undoubtedly, but I really wanted to go to the race. So off we went to Valencia, and we booked into this hotel, and we came down to breakfast on the first day, and it was just like the breakfast <laughs> <of> giant. <laughs> so he thinks I'm really, really cool. <laughs> See what movies do to us. Wow. <laughs> uh, woman right here. Yes. Um, hi. By the way, I'm a huge, huge fan, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, your performance has been real. Always uh, has transformed me, and I'm just thrilled. So, um, Thank you. Your performances have always transformed me, and I'm thrilled. Yes. How do you guys get used to all these people looking at you? I thought of all these amazing questions starting yesterday, and, uh, and I chose, this is the one I chose, because I feel like it's very uh, uh, like topical to me and my friends as artists in New York. Um, I think that obviously you have both reached a certain level of fame and success um, in your industry, and um, I think that when anyone follows their dream, there are certain risks Basically, the question is, if you could share, what were some of the risks that you took as artists, especially early on in your career, um, even though now you've obviously reached a position of fame and success, but you know, something that can inspire young artists working in New York? Well, uh, when, I, when, I, when I was in high school, um, the, you know, to make films, the idea that was sort of put upon me was, that you had to go to film school, that if you wanted to make films, you had to go to film school, and that was the only way. Um, my, my, my parents did, you know, sort of thought, I think what they thought was, just keep going to school, you know, maybe, just, just if, if, it, if you we have to be disguised under the film thing, go to school, but filmmakers that were, that had success, had been to film school and preached about film school, and. Um, I had had horrible experiences with school in general for a number of reasons, but um, I didn't, I didn't, I applied to film schools out of high school and I didn't get into any. And I, because I was a horrible student and I, and I struggled a lot with school, I wanted to, I wanted to make it work. I never really felt like I got, I never connected with any teachers. And um, the, the point that I'm getting to is that. After a couple of years of kicking around, I was terrified, and I, I was absolutely terrified. Um, and I and I, I went to community college. I got myself into NYU film school because I thought this is the only way that I can do it. They were right, you know. I was really scared, um, but it, it was against. It just didn't feel like it was the right thing to do. Really, underneath it for me, and so I got, I did all this work. I got into the film school, and I got there, and I was unhappy. It was, just wasn't for me. It is right for other people. It's right for a lot of people, but it wasn't right for me. I felt really confused and conflicted. And after all that work, I decided that I didn't want to be there. And I, I remember calling my dad and saying, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I did all, I'm, I don't want to be here. I'm going to leave. And um, he said, well, okay. And he said, I said, can I take the money and can I make a movie with it? <laughs> and he said, yeah. And he said, but that's it. That's it. And um, I, that, that's what I remember. It was a terrifying moment of risk. <laughs> like, I remember, you know, am I going to do it? Do I do it? And I did it. I was happy that I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Even as a professor in a film school, I congratulate you for that one. <laughs> and for you, Daniel. Any? I suppose the thing that springs to mind, it's more, it's more, in fact, it's something that I'm still dealing with, although I, I, it, I, 
I don't feel a sense of conflict about it in the way that I did when I was younger. Um, you know, the risks that one takes as a performer are obvious ones. And I figured out pretty quickly that the worst thing that can happen to you in taking those risks is that you make an utter fool of yourself, and that's not a bad thing. Um, so I don't really fully entertain that idea that we take risks in the work that we do. I suppose we gamble a little bit on our reputations, so what? You know, it, it's, it's important that we try and do good work and try and be involved in work that is recognized as being good work so we get to do more work if we want to do it and so on. But anyhow, the world doesn't stop turning. Um, but in a general way, uh, something that that I learned luckily when I was still quite young, and that's that we were encouraged when I was at college. I mean, my, my theater school in England was, you know, traditional Stanislavski training. It was three years. It was both formal and, uh, and, um, uh, and yet, in, you know, not, not restrictively so, but it was a formal training. And, and one of the many things they told us encouraged us to believe that an actor is an actor when he's working. If you, you know, that when you, that when you leave the school, if you get a chance to work, you work. Otherwise, you're not doing that thing that you're, that you're um, supposedly destined to do. Now, I, like a lot of young people, had a very wish to have a very pure and clear notion of the order of things. So it, it, it really bugged the hell out of me that a question mark remained over this. Um, uh, I wasn't entirely sure that I was fit to do this work in the way that they encouraged me to think it had to be done. And so I started off. I was very lucky. I got some work out of school, straight out of school. It was very fulfilling work. And then at the end of that, I went through that experience that we all do at some point. I, 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 I came to a dead end. And no one knew the hell I was, and I, had to, I felt I had something to offer, and no one wanted to know. But it's a very long-winded way of <laughs> describing this. But, but I, the thing I'm getting at is that, uh, is that I, I understood early on that I couldn't work unless I felt a compelling need to do so. And that if I didn't have that feeling, and I somehow believe that this applies to all uh, creative fields, if I didn't have that compelling need to do the work, then I absolutely not just should do something else, I had a responsibility to get out and do something else. And so my rhythm has been apparently a very strange one because every single day I'm questioned about it. Why do I not work more often? The reason I don't work more often is because I love what I do. It's a very joyful thing for me. It's not an act of self-flagellation. When I'm not doing that work, I, I, I'm, I don't live a reclusive um, and antisocial life. I, I try and re-engage with the world in such a way that that, in turn, allows me to do the work that I need to do when I need to do it. And so I think, more than anything else, having taken that risk uh, numerous times at the beginning when I really didn't have any reason to expect that people would be patient with me, um, I understood that each person has to find their own rhythm. It's, the, it's not an easy thing to find, but it's something that once you've found it, you absolutely have to hold on to that. I know that there are more questions, however, we have kept these wonderful gentlemen up very, very late, and I'm going to just on <laughs> behalf of everyone, thank you, Paul Thomas thank, Anderson, thank, thank you, thank Daniel Day-Lewis, good luck with this Christmas release. <laughs>